good evening everyone so we are in for a very interesting webinar today where i will be talking to you about everything that you need to know about heart disease in children in a nutshell so the outline of today's talk will be the scope and definition of heart disease in children how common is it do all of them need surgery what are the myths about heart disease in children when should you suspect heart disease can and why do we miss them at times what are the syndromic associations what are the investigations how do you classify and why should you classify heart disease what is normal versus abnormal heart cyanotic versus asyanotic heart what are the various management options we talk about curative and palliative univentricular repair versus a biventricular repair surgical management versus catheter based management lastly what is the role of nutrition drugs good oral hygiene vena section and use of oxygen in these babies and children so coming to the definition of heart disease in children we can broadly classify them into congenital and acquired so what do you mean by congenital heart disease that is these babies are born with a defect or disease affecting their heart from birth so these babies when they are born they'll have a heart disease so that is obviously called congenital heart disease compared to acquired heart disease where the baby is born with a normal heart but later on due to some infection some disease process which affects the heart muscle valves or coronary arteries they develop a disease of the heart so these babies are born with a normal heart but later on progress to have a diseased heart so that's what we mean by acquired heart disease how common is heart disease in children we know coronary artery disease atherosclerosis tens in adults is very common now even in the young adults but how common is heart disease in children parents can ask you your relations can ask you your friends can ask you is it a common problem in our country so coming back to this how common is congenital heart disease in sri lanka so what is the disease burden it's roughly about 8 babies per 1000 live births will be born with congenital heart disease so if you say 1000 babies are born eight of them will have some sort of heart disease so if i have shown you a graph of the number of live births from 2008 to 2019 so roughly there is a, we are we have about 330 to 370 babies born each year so as you can notice the birth rate has been coming down from around 370000 to 330000 over the past 10 years so if i put this equation of 8 per 1000 live births we can see that roughly about 2500 to 3000 children will be born each year with some sort of congenital heart disease how do i get that number by putting 8 per 1000 so 1000 will have 8 so this 300000 will have how many so there will be roughly around 2500 to 3000 children born each year so these are the children that you can see various forms various types of congenital heart disease in our country so roughly there will be about 2500 to 3000 children born each year with congenital heart disease so do all of them need treatment or surgery congenital heart disease one third of them will have a severe form for example transposition of great artery severe coarctation another one third will have a moderately severe form like a vsd asd av canal defect another one third of them will have the very mild form like mild pulmonary stenosis mild diatic stenosis a pfo a small pda where the severe and moderately severe forms will need some sort of intervention so if you take two thirds of them will need intervention and the mild form one third will need no intervention so although we have 2500 children born all of them don't need any surgery or intervention only two third of them will need some sort of intervention so out of this intervention a part can be done catheter based in the cath lab without open heart surgery and another part will be done surgically so this is what i told you do all of them need to be treated no some will need treatment in the cath lab some will need treatment in the surgery so as i told you do all of them need to be treated no two thirds will need some sort of intervention 
and one third will not need any form of intervention. So what are the misconceptions or myths about congenital heart disease? So there are several myths. One, is it rare in Sri Lanka? No. It contributes only to a tiny fraction of the infant mortality? No. As you know, the infant mortality has drastically reduced over the past years. Why? Initially, diarrhea was causing a lot of infant mortality. Pneumonia was causing a lot of infant mortality. So we have been able to tackle all those problems. But now we are stuck with a static infant mortality. One main reason is due to congenital heart disease. So we haven't been able to sort tackle that problem completely. So it contributes to a significant fraction of today's infant mortality in our country, which we need to address. Another misconception is even if it's diagnosed, what can be done? Most cannot be corrected in the neonatal period and infancy. So what's the point? Some have a misconception that you need a minimum weight of 10 kilograms before you go for surgery. After treatment, many would not lead normal lives. All will need surgery and the outcome of interventions are poor. So all what I have listed here are myths or means misconceptions. That means they are not true. So when should you suspect heart disease in children? That's one thing that you should watch out in your practice. One in during your training period, get your eyes, get your mindset. How do you suspect heart disease in children? Because if you miss them, sometimes it can be deadly. So for how do you pick it up? You need a high level of suspicion. Some can be asymptomatic and incidentally found. For example, like at the school medical inspection, the doctor hears a murmur and refers and they find that the child has a ASD. Or it can be a murmur. They can present with cyanosis. They can present with heart failure sometimes failure to thrive, recurrent respiratory tract infections, needing repeated hospital admissions or antibiotics, poor feeding, the mother will tell you, baby finds it difficult to suck, he sucks intermittently or he stops, feeds, stops. There's a lot of scalp sweating, abnormal pulses, especially the femorals may be weak, effort intolerance, the child cannot play like his peers, he feels very tired, palpitations, and syncope. So these are a few things that point towards a heart disease. So can and why do we miss heart disease in children? Because sometimes you see the mother's parents coming and telling, doctor check my baby before discharge and said, what is it? come back, maybe around two weeks, says that the baby has something wrong with the heart, do and get the baby checked. So, one reason is the baby can be asymptomatic at this time. You can miss just by the skin and examination alone. Early discharge, as even after cesarean sections, how they decide to be discharged on day one, day two. So, then their lung resistance is still high. So, lung patients will not be heard because of this, because the lung resistance is high, RB pressures are high, so the shunt is minimal. So, you don't hear much. They go home, RB pressures drop, lung resistance drop, and the shunt begins to appear. So then you will hear a murmur when you see the baby around four weeks. Duct dependent lesions may not be such till days or weeks after birth. Because the duct may take longer to flow. If the duct closes early, then you can diagnose the baby will be blue or the baby will present with shock. But this does not happen when you miss it because you discharge them early. I know that the hemoglobin may mask cyanose. Intermittent symptomatic arrhythmia. Careful examination, examination not done. Taking of the femoral. Mother's concerns disregarded. Example, the mother comes and says, before discharge, I told the doctor, I told the nurse that the baby is becoming blue on sucking. But they just told me, don't worry, baby is cold, wrap up the baby, things should be well. So how to minimize missing these serious congenital heart disease in newborns or what should be done? We need to understand the normal changes that occur at birth. We need to do a very careful newborn and six weeks examination. Sometimes the newborn examination is done shabbily where we may not be doing it in the proper way, maybe due to overwork, understaffing, but still we, we should make sure that we do a proper newborn examination and examination before they are discharged. We need to rule out congenital heart disease, especially if the baby is syndromic. So some common syndromes that are associated with heart disease are trisomy 13, Down syndrome, trisomy 18, Edwards syndrome. 
sorry, trisomy 13 Patau, 18 Edwards, and trisomy 21 is Down syndrome. Then Noonan, Turner, William, and other congenital anomalies. Systematic examination of the CVS, cardiovascular system in all babies. If we do that, very unlikely that we are going to miss. Simple additional screening when in doubt, like pulse oximetry is very, very useful to spot, pick up cyanotic, heart baby, cyanotic uh, babies, because you may miss by looking at the baby, baby doesn't look blue. But if you check the oxygen saturation, you are sure to pick many of them, who otherwise will come back to you after a couple of weeks very blue. Always pay attention to the mother's concern, such as bluish on sucking and crying, difficulty in feeding, scab sweating, poor weight gain. So always pay attention to this and don't disregard. Most often mothers are correct. So should you actively look for congenital heart disease, as I told you, in babies with syndromes? So this is a baby with Down syndrome or trisomy 21, where you can see the trisomy the extra chromosome here. So in trisomy babies, 40% of them will have some sort of congenital heart disease. So it's very important if you see a baby with trisomy 21 to rule out congenital heart disease. So the commonest will be a AV septal defect or AV canal defect. They also can have ESDs, ASDs, Tetralogy of Fallow and PDA. So always pay attention to this in syndromic babies. Edward syndrome or trisomy 18. Again, they are prone to have congenital heart disease. <coughs> As you can see here, the trisomy 18 over here. So they can have this overlapping of fingers. They can have your rocker bottom feet, low set tears, micronathia, white space nipples. Again, I'm showing you the overlapping. So in these babies also, you need to rule out congenital heart disease. Turner syndrome, again, 45X0. You can see that here in the analysis. So they are prone to get have bicuspidiatic valve, coarctation, aortic dilatation, dissection, and rupture. So webbing of the neck is seen here, white space nipples. Noonan syndrome, again, 50% of them can have pulmonary stenosis. They have a dysplastic pulmonary valve. They can have a ASD, they can have a VSD, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So you can have the partial ptosis here, low set tears, and downward slanting eyes compared to the uh, trisomy 21. William syndrome, again, happy elfin faces these children have. Uh, by filtrum over here. So they are prone to have supravalviatic stenosis and branch pulmonary stenosis with your hypercalcemia. Marfan syndrome, again, make it a point to rule out any congenital heart disease. Here you can see your arachnodactyly, your wrist sign over here, your thumb sign, very high heart palate, and pest planus, your fat, flat feet. So they can have mitral valve prolapse, tricuspid valve prolapse, aortic root dilatation, and the more dreaded thing is resulting in aortic dissection. Tuberous sclerosis, where you can see your rhabdomyomas in the heart, where you get these tumors, which generally often we see in the ventricle. So this echo picture will show this large hypercogenic mass is sitting in the right ventricle. It's originating from the interventricular septum. So usually what happens is these rhabdomyomas generally resolve. It usually gets bigger, bigger and get smaller and resolved. So they don't need any surgical intervention unless they are huge and they are causing some resistance or impedance to the valves. So this you can see the adenoma sebaceum here. You can see the shag green patch over here and the ash leaf patch. So if you see that, you need to rule out rhabdomyomas in the heart as well. So Cornelia Dillon syndrome, where you have synophrysis here. Again, these babies are prone to have VSDs, ASDs, pulmonary stenosis, and tetralogy of fallow. Baby of diabetic mother, again, these babies, you can see they are very plethoric, macrosomic babies. So they can have diabetic cardiomyopathy, where they have left ventricular hypertrophy, asymmetrical hypertrophy of the septum, which again resolves. You need not need, do, need any treatment. They usually resolve. They can have are more prone to get VSDs, TGAs, and truncus arteriosus. Familial hypercholesterolemia, you can see these thickened plaques on this child and the hugely elevated cholesterol levels. This is another child with progeria where there is 
premature aging again via needs cardiac assessment. So now once we have been done with the syndromes, I would like to talk to you something about the, what are the tests available for this diagnosis. Now you have suspected someone, so what should you do or how could you pick them up? So the tests that are available are the basic test, pulse oximetry, which should be used, which is underutilized at the moment, ECG, helpful sometimes, helpful especially in the management of arrhythmias, chest x-ray, yes. ECHO, very helpful, very useful, a non-invasive method of making most of the diagnosis. Further imaging such as cardiac CT, cardiac MRI, and cardiac catheterization and angiography are added, more sophisticated investigation tools in the management and diagnosis of congenital heart disease. So pulse oximetry, when in doubt, always check. There is nothing lost, just don't say, just don't try to reassure the mother saying, no, that's normal. Your baby is not blue, it's because it's cold, wrap up the baby, no. Just take a few extra minutes, connect to the pulse oximetry and make sure you get a proper reading. So there is no point in just saying I checked pulse oximetry, it was normal. So how could this be? So make sure that you do it in a proper way. So I have shown you two pictures here. Here the reading is 100, you can be happy with it. But no, you are not having a proper waveform. So this may be erroneous. This is better. You waited for a proper waveform and you said it's 100. So sometimes we are in a hurry, we are in a rush. We just see a number and say that's normal. No. Spend some time. So it can be misleading and misleading and it can just give a false reassurance if it's used incorrectly. You need to watch over a period of at least a minute, not just put the probe, next second, whatever reading comes, you go away with that. You need a stable waveform. So that's what I mean by a stable waveform and not this. Heart rate display correlating with the actual heart rate. So this will show you the heart rate of 95. So if this shows you a heart 100 and a heart rate of 30, you're not going to take it. Something wrong somewhere. So always try to correlate things. And you need to protect the probe from light. So what are the clues to say it's cyanosis can be due to cardiac causes or non-cardiac causes, like a respiratory cause, or it can be due to a central nervous system cause. So how do you know whether it's more in favor of a cardiac cause or not? So absence of grunting or severe intercostal recessions. If the baby is otherwise looking well but still blue without respiratory distress, it's more in favor of cardiac. If it's respiratory, yes, there'll be grunting, there'll be recessions, then it's more in favor of a respiratory cause. It can be a diaphragmatic hernia or it can be a lung hypoplasia. But if you don't have that, always think it's more in favor of cardiac. It appears a few hours after birth. So as soon as the baby is born, baby looks very well. But one, two hours, three babies move to the ward. Then the baby starts showing symptoms. So that's again a clue for uh, a cardiac cause where the baby was normal but starts getting cyanose gradually once goes to the ward. But if it's respiratory or something else, baby will be immediately cyanose soon after birth. You will have differential cyanosis. That means upper limbs will be normal, lower limbs will be low. So that's what you mean by differential diagnosis. So this happens in PPHN. Reverse differential diagnosis, where your upper limbs will be blue and the lower limbs will be uh, pink. So this all occurs in cardiac causes. If it's respiratory, you don't get either differential cyanosis, neither do you get reverse differential cyanosis. Abnormal physical examination like ECG or chest X-ray, abnormal hyperoxia test. So all these are in favor of a cardiac cause. So what can be used to aid the diagnosis? One is a hyperoxia test, which is not very much used these days. So what do we do? <clears throat> you need to give 100% oxygen to the baby for around 10 minutes, and then you check the PO2. So these are the values. So if your PO2 value is less than 150, see congenital heart disease likely. If your PO2 is less than 70, it's very likely. But if your PO2 rises with your 100% oxygen more than 200, congenital heart disease is very, very unlikely. It's more likely to be a respiratory cause because cardiac causes doesn't, don't usually correct with oxygen. So that's one way of diagnosing it. Chest X-ray, sometimes useful. What are the things we look for? Either increased or decreased pulmonary blood flow, which we call plethoric or non-oligemic lung fields. We look for cardiomegaly and the typical chest X-ray appearances. So this 
get used to the chest X-ray. So that right, this border will be formed by the right atrium. Here you will get the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle. <coughs> and this will be your pulmonary artery. So these are the borders that will form your chest X-ray. So for example, here you can see your right atrium is enlarged. So this is in favor of a pre-tricuspid shunt where more blood is coming from the right atrium into your right ventricle. So looking at this chest X-ray, you can say that the right atrium is enlarged. Here, what do you see? You see a large heart and it's like on an egg on a side appearance. So this is typical of a TGA, transposition of great arteries. And you get a very narrow pedicle here. Can you see this? A narrow pedicle and you get an egg on a side appearance, which is a typical feature of transposition of great arteries. Here, what do you see? You get a very ground glass like X-ray. This is a newborn on the ventilator now. This is the X-ray. So what are your differential diagnosis? One is hyaline membrane disease. And the other thing you should always suspect is obstructed total anomalous pulmonary drainage. So babies on the ventilator, if he's not recovering, hyaline membrane disease, this baby should recover after a couple of days. But still you're stuck on the ventilator, very difficult to ventilate, saturations are low, then always think whether there is an obstructed tap VD or is there a cardiac cause rather than going on ventilating the baby for weeks and weeks. So this should be at the back of your mind and in your differential diagnosis of hyaline membrane disease. Reduced pulmonary blood flow, for example, in pulmonary atresia, can you see the lung fields are very black. Why? Because there is little blood going into the lungs. So if you have a baby born and you see the saturation is low, you do the chest X-ray and you see these oligemic lung fields, then you should suspect this is a duct-dependent pulmonary circulation, pulmonary blood flow is less. So one indication to commence prostaglandin here. So that's one importance of identifying this. So if you see this and low saturation, you know this baby's pulmonary blood flow is less. So you know what to do and you know you need to get urgent uh, further evaluation. This is a chest X-ray of a child. Can you see? It's like a figure of eight. You can see one part here, then the other part of the eight here, other part here. So this is typical feature that you see in a supracardiac total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. So what, is, what do these borders form? So this is your real heart. This is the vertical vein where all the pulmonary veins join here anomalously and it doesn't open into the left atrium. It goes by a vertical vein up here. So that's how it forms this border of the X-ray. Then it joins the innominate vein and it comes down to the right SVC or the SVC. So the SVC is dilated here. So that's what forms the margin of this figure of eight. So figure of eight, snowman, they call it in various names. <coughs> this is another typical feature, a boot shape. So you can see it's like a big boot. So it's typical of tetralogy of fellow. Again, the lung fields will be oligemic because there is less pulmonary blood flow because of the pulmonary stenosis. And this is the, this is the typical chest X-ray appearance. Here, what do you see? You see a massive heart. See the heart feeling going from one thoracic wall to the next thoracic wall. So what do you see? Massive cardiomegaly. Your first differential diagnosis, if it's a bigger child coming into the emergency, shortness of breath, chest pain, having tachycardia, having tachypnea, first guess should be, this is a massive pericardial effusion. So you need early evaluation. Other issues, other causes are, it can be a cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, massive flabby heart, ventricular dysfunction, heart is huge. Or it can be endocardial fibrosis, or it can be Epstein anomaly. Epstein anomaly, you see this typical X-ray neonate, the neonate born, baby cyanos, you do the chest X-ray, you don't see any lung, it's full of heart. So this is one typical feature of natal Epstein. So massive cardiomegaly, if it's a child, be watchful, always for pericardial effusion as an emergency. If it's a neonate, always think, could it be a neonatal Epstein? In the attachment, you can see this heart within a heart. You can see one border here. Then you can see another border here. I have shown that other border with these arrows. Can you see? Appreciate that? One big one. That's the real heart. This is another heart within the heart. So this border forms by the left atrium because the left atrium is posterior. One of the most posterior structures in the heart. So that enlarges and it looks like this on a chest X-ray. This is typical in mitral stenosis, especially in chronic rheumatic heart disease. You get stenosis of the mitral valve. 
So the mitral LA blood cannot flow through the mitral valve. So it gets accumulated and your LA gets grossly enlarged. X-ray will show you that. So that's MS causing LA enlargement. What do you see here? You can see the undersurface of the ribs. You can see it's eaten up, like moth eaten here. All are eaten up. So here, another picture of that. So this is typical of coarctation. Coarctation, what you call the rib notching. Why do they get these rib notching? Because the collateral vessels enlarge and they erode these undersurface of the ribs. So that happens in coarctation. You don't say in neonates because they haven't developed collaterals. Usually you see it in older children, maybe after three, four years, you can see this collateral because that's the time they develop collaterals and that's the time they erode the ribs. And if you do your chest X-ray, you will notice this. ECG, generally not very helpful to diagnose congenital heart disease, but again, it can help in determining, determining the axis. For example, a newborn with a left axis going up here, who is cyanose, you can diagnose, or it's more in favor of a tricuspid atresia. Again, a newborn with child features of trisomy 21, again, a left axis, it's more in favor of a AV canal defect. So that's basically how it will help. Also, it will help in your arrhythmia management. Echocardiogram, I would say, is the most important or gold standard in the diagnosis of congenital heart disease. So this is a <clears throat> moving frame of an echocardiogram that I'm showing you. So basically, we can look at all the structures in the heart. So for example, this is the right atrium. This is the left atrium, right ventricle. So you can see the tricuspid valve opening and closing, mitral valve opening and closing. Then we can again visualize by tilting the probe, the iota going from. So, so you can see everything in the heart. So here you can appreciate this is the interior septum, which has a hole here. So he has a ASD. So if there's a hole in the ventricular septum, you'll see that. If this valve is stenosed, you'll see that. If there's a leak, once you put color, you will see this. So two-dimensional echocardiogram with Doppler is the gold standard in diagnosis of congenital heart disease. All other CTs, cardiac catheterizations, MRI, are all added things once you have arrived at a diagnosis by doing a detailed echocardiogram. So this is a cardiac CT, which you will see the pulmonary artery is shown here with the pulmonary veins. This is a Shimita vein. Again, this is a cardiac CT with reconstruction, which shows a arterial tortuosity syndrome where they show a abnormally tortuous iota. This is a cardiac MRI, which again can show you the structure. <coughs> and since of late, with more uh, sophisticated software, they have started, begun to uh, involve the dimensions and even uh, comment on the functions of the left ventricle and right ventricle. So more and more cardiac MRI is being used to replace cardiac catheterization, and, but not echocardiogram, echocardiograms, which are the gold standard. Cardiac catheterization, as you can see here, you inject dye and look at the various structures in the heart. So this is injected in the iota. You can see the ascending iota. You can see all the head and neck vessels going. You can see a dilated coronary artery here. This picture shows an injection in a glen shunt and filling of the pulmonary arteries. So these are sternal wires where this child has had a cardiac surgery before. So what is the importance of, should we classify heart disease in children? If I, we talk to you about DORV, TOF, Epstein, VSD, it looks a very complicated issue. But is it really so? So if I show you this, these are all acyanotic heart disease, like coarctation, partial AV canal defect, diatic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, AV canal defect, iota pulmonary window, VSD, so mitral stenosis, all these babies won't be blue. But on the other hand, here there's another group of babies who will be blue. Tricuspid atresia, tetralogy of fallow, transposition of great arteries, hyperplastic left heart syndrome, mitral atresia, total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, children with single ventricle, single, children with truncus arteriosus, ch children with an Epstein anomaly. So here you get a whole lot. So how do we remember all these? How, how can we have a working way of classifying this? so that it will help us in the management of these children because it's impossible to remember or study the management for each of these. So it's always good to group them. So that's what I'm going to talk to you. So carefully, clearly get this in. 
and try to understand. So if we take heart disease in children, broadly, let's classify it into congenital and acquired. So we talk to you about congenital, where they are born with a heart disease, and acquired, where they are quite later down, down the lane. So congenital heart disease, you all know, we'll divide it into acyanotic and cyanotic. Then again, acyanotic heart lesions, we can again divide it into either shunt lesions. If you have a shunt, you will always have increased pulmonary blood flow. Or you can have obstructive lesions, where there will be reduced pulmonary or systemic blood flow. Or you can have other lesions, such as cardiomyopathies or various valvular heart disease, where you are born with a cardiomyopathy. For example, various urea cycle defects, mitochondriopathies can end up with congenital cardiomyopathies. So shunt lesions, again, we can divide it into shunts before the tricuspid valve or above the tricuspid valve. For example, atrial septal defect, partial anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, or shunt lesions below the tricuspid valve, or we call it post-tricuspid valve. So after the tricuspid valve or below, are, what are the shunts? Either it can be a VSD, or it can be a PDA, or it can be a iota pulmonary window. So all these will cause inc increased pulmonary blood flow. These babies won't be blue. Why? Because the shunt is always from the left to right. So oxygenated blood will be coming into the deoxygenated side. So these babies cannot be blue. So that's why we call them acyanotic shunt lesions. So obstructive lesions, obstruction, easy. It or, or to get obstructed, you should have a valve. So the heart has four valves. So on the right side, we have the pulmonary valve and the tricuspid valve. So we can end up with pulmonary stenosis or tricuspid stenosis. On the left side, we can have aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, or if you walk down the aorta, you can end up with a coarctation. So again, these babies will be blue. We will be not blue. Why? Because there is no right to left shunt. So they will be acyanotic heart lesions. So all the acyanotic heart lesions can be categorized into these categories. So always remember, Either it's a shunt or it's obstructive lesions or there are the other lesions. Obstructive shunt lesions pre or post tricuspid. Obstructive lesions is it right or left? So now we'll come to the cyanotic heart lesions. So cyanotic heart lesions, we always think it should be due to reduced pulmonary blood flow. No. So again, we can categorize it into reduced pulmonary blood flow situations and situations with increased pulmonary blood flow. So what are the conditions where you have reduced pulmonary blood flow? That's called tough physiology. So the cyanotic heart lesions, I like to categorize them according to their physiology. So physiology number one is certain category has reduced pulmonary blood flow. That we call into tough physiology. So what should these tough physiology babies have? They should have a VSD where they will have mixing, but they should have significant PS where the shunt will be not left to right, but right to left. So for example, in Tetralogia fellow, they have a VSD, they have severe PS. So the shunt is from the right ventricle to the left ventricle. So deoxygenated blood going and mixing with oxygenated blood and pumping into the iota. These babies are blue. Single ventricle, all the right atrium and the left atrium desaturated and saturated blood comes and mixes in the single ventricle. And there is pulmonary stenosis. So again, they are reduced pulmonary blood flow, but these babies are blue. Tricuspid atresia with pulmonary stenosis. All the systemic blood comes into the right atrium, desaturated blood. It can't get into the right ventricle because the tricuspid valve is atritic. So it goes through the AST into the left atrium, mixes with the saturated blood, comes into your left ventricle, then through a VSD gets into the atritic right ventricle and it's pumped into the pulmonary artery where they have a stenosis. So this group will also fall into the tough physiology. So these babies will be blue and they will have reduced pulmonary blood flow. So we are not worried that this group of babies will have heart failure. Why? To have heart failure, they should have a high pulmonary blood flow. So baby with tetralogy of fellow, no one is going to be worried and give them frusamide saying this baby is in heart failure. No, he cannot go into heart failure because he has significant pulmonary stenosis. There is a single ventricle baby with severe PS. You are not going to say this baby has heart failure. Why? He cannot have heart failure because pulmonary stenosis is reducing the amount of blood that is going into the lungs. So that's the impo importance of knowing the physiology. Otherwise, blanketly, we will, single ventricle, we'll be all giving prosomide. Or everyone will be doing some management. No, everything man depends on your physiology. So reduced pulmonary, then that's the group of reduced pulmonary blood flow. Increased pulmonary blood flow either can be mixing, because there's huge mixing, 
the baby is blue. For example, the mixing can be at the atrial level, where the systemic veins or the SVC, IVC come into the RA. For example, a total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. All the pulmonary veins come and drain into the right atrium. All the systemic veins again come into the right atrium. So all the blood gets mixed in the right atrium. So that's the admixture physiology. Then this whole huge volume of blood gets into the RV and pumped into the lungs. So you have a huge amount of pulmonary blood flow, but still they are blue. Why? Because everything gets mixed in the atrium and the ventricle. Then mixing at the ventricle level. For example, you think this child has a single ventricle. So every, all the right atrium blood, which is desaturated, will come into the ventricle. Saturated blood from the left atrium will come into the ventricle and they'll get mixed. And they are pumped into the pulmonary artery. If they have a pulmonary stenosis, then they'll fall into the top physiology. But if they don't have a pulmonary stenosis, with this huge pressure, all this blood will go into the pulmonary artery. So then they will be blue, but they'll have increased pulmonary blood flow. So they'll be tachypneic. They'll be helpful if you need to give frosamide. Truncus arteriosus is where the mixing occurs at the great arterial level, where both iota, the pulmonary artery comes off the iota. So all the blood gets mixed in this common vessel and it goes into the pulmonary artery. Again, they have increased pulmonary blood flow, but still they are blue. So that's admixture physiology. Then the next physiology will be the TGA physiology, where you will have the transposition of great arteries and transposition of great arteries with a ventricular septal defect. So always remember, all cyanotic heart lesions can be put into these three physiology. If it's a tough physiology, they should have a VSD and they should have significant PS. So this will, these children will not go into heart failure. Admixture physiology, yes, these children will go into heart failure because they don't have pulmonary stenosis and they have increased pulmonary blood flow. These children again have increased pulmonary blood flow and they will, uh, they are also blue. So all these children are blue. Physiology is different. So get into this chart is very important. It's a simplified chart, very easy to remember. You can jot it down slowly and all your heart lesions, try to fit it here because it helps in the management. Acquired heart disease, you know of rheumatic heart disease, you know of endocarditis, Kawasaki disease. Again, it's a clinical diagnosis. You don't wait for coronary changes to occur and ask do an echo until you start IVIG. It's a clinical diagnosis and you can have dreaded consequences, coronary artery dilatation, you can have aneurysms, you can have myocardial infarction. We have a 80 year old child who underwent uh, cardio, uh, underwent bypass. She had two grafts done, sent to candy to get it done. So uh, it's a very dreaded disease to have. You can have a high mortality. Then myocarditis following various viral infections, dengue, cardiomyopathy again following various infections. So this chart, just take time, get it into your uh, system, congenital acquired, congenital acyanotic and cyanotic, acyanotic shunts, obstructions and others, cyanotic, it can be reduced pulmonary blood flow, increased pulmonary blood flow, then reduced pulmonary blood flow is tough physiology because they have a PS, increased pulmonary blood flow is either admixture because it's, everything is mixing, Mixing again, you divide. Mixing at the atrial level, mixing at the ventricle level, mixing at the great arterial level. So atrial level, tap PD, ventricle level, single ventricle, great arterial level, it will be a truncus. Then TGA physiology, your TGA with a VSD and intact septum. So what are the management options? So either your management options can be curative or palliative. Curative means you do something, either surgery or catheter base, and you cure it. You have a hole, you close it. You have a stenosis well, you open it up. Palliative is you cannot do that. You cannot cure that. But you'll have to do some surgery to improve this child's quality of life. For example, if he is very blue, you'll have to put a shunt. If he has more blood, pulmonary blood flow, you may have to put a PA band. So those are called palliative surgeries where you don't cure them, but you do something to improve their quality of life. So these curative and palliative surgeries, they can be either catheter based or they can be in the surgical. So management option, curative, for example, curative surgeries are like ASDs, VSDs, PD, most, most of the, or all asynatic heart lesions can be cured. Palliative surgeries are for the complex lesions, like tricuspid atresia, where there is no valve, you can't create a valve. Mitral atresia, no valve, you can't create a valve. Single ventricle, they have only one ventricle, you can't divide it again. 
hyperplastic left heart syndrome, pulmonary atresia with everything, intact ventricular septum. So all these you cannot cure. So what you can do is you do palliative surgeries. For example, these are a few names like a PA band, BT shunt, bidirectional glen shunt, uh, Norwood procedure, a Fontan procedure. So all these are palliative procedures. So congenital heart disease, acyanotic and cyanotic, acyanotic heart lesions, 99% or 100% are curative. Sometimes if the babies are small, it's difficult. For example, if a baby has <coughs> a whole lot of multiple VSDs, baby weighs only two kilograms, surgeon can't go in and find the VSDs, then you can go in and put a PA band and let the baby grow, then come back when the baby is older, remove the PA band, close the VSD. So ultimately you end up a curative procedure. Cyanotic heart lesions, it can be curative, for example, a TGA, a TOF, but certain ones you have to palliate, either PA band or BT shunt, then they will need a bidirectional glen shunt, they'll need fontan completion, and ultimately or eventually they will need a heart or heart-lung transplant. Certain cyanotic heart lesions, you may do a palliative procedure, for example, a TOF in the neonatal period is very blue. You cannot manage them. You do a BT shunt. When the child is around one year, you can take off the BT shunt and correct him. So there you can go to a curative surgery. <coughs> so what are the goals in management of congenital heart disease? Always we should aim for biventricular repair. If not possible, then we go for univentricular repair. So what do you mean by biventricular repair? Right atrium pumps in the right ventricle. The right ventricle, you should aim to make it flow into the pulmonary artery. And the left ventricle should pump into the iota. So by two ventricles are pumping into two great arteries. So example, a tetralogy of fellow, what do they do? They will close the VSD and they will relieve the pulmonary stenosis. So what happens? Our right ventricle will pump into the pulmonary artery. Left ventricle will pump into the iota. So you have created, you have done a biventricular repair. There are two ventricles which are functioning. Similarly, in an AV canal, this is a common AV canal defect. You can see there is an ASD component, there is a VSD component, and there is a single AV valve. So what will the surgeon do? He will close the ASD, he will close the VSD, and this single AV valve, he will make it back into two. So again, it's a biventricle repair. Why? We have two ventricles. Right ventricle will pump into the pulmonary artery, and the left ventricle will pump into the iota. What do you mean by a univentricular repair? For example, if you take this, a single ventricle. So in a single ventricle procedure, you cannot get the single ventricle to pump into both the iota and the pulmonary artery. So then you separate the ventricles, and this ventricle now, once you do your glen shunt, you anastomose your SVC to the pulmonary artery. Then you go on and anastomose the IVC to the pulmonary artery. So that's fontan. And your single ventricle will now pump only into the iota. Your pulmonary artery is shut. So the pulmonary artery will get flow this way and your ventricle will pump only into the iota. So this is called a single ventricle or univentricle repair. So these are not ideal repairs. Always these repairs end up with some sort of problem because these ventricles, hearts are not meant to pump in this fashion, although we make it do so to give some comfort to the child. But in the long run, they always run into issues. So single ventricle repairs, univentricle repairs are always uh, in, we encounter problems. So always you should aim for biventricle repair, but sometimes you have no option but go for single ventricle repairs. So this is the normal heart, just to show you. Your SVC, IVC comes into your RA, RV, pumps into the pulmonary artery. It collects the oxygen from both sides from the lungs, gives out its carbon dioxide. Then via four pulmonary veins, it comes into the LA, LV, out into the iota and the head and neck vessels. You can have any lesion coming anywhere. Any holes here, any narrowing of the valves, chambers can be absent, you know, these vessels can be transposed, both can come from this side, both vessels can come from here. So there can be various anomalies that we can encounter. So what do you mean by acyanotic versus cyanotic? Acyanotic is these children are not blue. So for example, shunts, like a ASD, shunt is left to right. So they cannot be blue. For them to be blue, blue blood should go that way. But that doesn't happen in a simple ASD. Simple VSD, no. But if the VSD develops Eisenmenger, his shunt goes the other way. Then this child can become blue. Cyanotic heart lesions, the shunt is always right to left. So then they are blue. Why right to left? Desaturated blood goes, mix, and it pumps into the iota. So there is a mixture. They become desaturated. So that's the... That's the physiology or that's the pathophysiology of how 
cyanotic can acyanotic heart lesions develop their colors what do acyanotic heart defects look like hole in the atrial septum asd hole in the ventricular septum vsd there is a connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery it's a pda there can be a narrowing of the pulmonary artery ps narrowing of the aortic valve as or it can be a stricture here which is coarctation so all these babies will be not blue they'll be pink so what do cyanotic heart lesions look like for example tetralogia fallow where they have a vsd and pulmonary stenosis shunt is right to left they are blue tga the both great arteries are switched aorta which should come from the left ventricle is coming from the right ventricle pulmonary artery has gone to the left ventricle so all the desaturated blood will go into the aorta so these babies are blue tricuspid atresia valve is absent so all the blue blood gets into the la mixers and purple blood goes into the aorta which causes cyanosis so acyanotic heart lesion just to give you an overview asd vsd pda av canal defects and aorta pulmonary window so asd there are different types you can have depending on the position in the atrial septum we can call it a sinus stenosis asd ostium secundum asd which is the most commonest which you see in the foramen fossa ovalis level then you get a primum asd or again a sinus stenosis type of asd so these are the types of asds and a rare form which is the coronary sinus type of asd so in this picture you will see the asds up here will be the sinus stenosis middle ostium secundum down here will be the ostium primum asd so only ostium secundum asds are divisible majority of ostium secundum asds can be closed using a device so when do we close it usually at preschool age because there is a chance of them getting smaller also there is no risk of these children developing pulmonary hypertension because the pulmonary hypertension is just flow related here pulmonary arteries are not exposed to high pressure is just flow so flow to cause pulmonary hypertension takes decades so that's why we wait the children are a bit older but we like to close it before they go to school because otherwise they will miss their school so these are the options this is the device it's made of nickel and titanium it's a double disc device with interwoven fabric in here so this is the one which will be placed across the defect so this shows you how the defect will be this is in a patient for some reason has undergone surgery and the show how the device looks like so this shows how a device will be deployed across the defect so this is the beating heart through the ivc we have gone ra through the asd in the left atrium we deploy the left atrial disc there then we come back and de deploy the right atrial disc and then this screw will be unscrewed and this will stay for the rest of the life so it's a relatively simple procedure takes around 20 minutes to 30 minutes and the child can be discharged the following day there are no blood transfusion no icu stays so they need to be on aspirin for 6 months following the procedure until this device gets epithelialized here the device is unscrewed everything is taken out so that's a ac device closure compared to ac surgical closure where the child will end up with a scar and the surgeon will take the pericardium around the heart and keep it and close the defect so majority of defects can be closed in the cath lab using devices and a few will go for surgery if the margins are inadequate ventricular septal defect majority will have surgery majority of these children are very small if they are large they even need to be closed during the first few months one month two months of life because the pulmonary artery is exposed to high pressure here as the pulmonary valve open the rv lv pressure will be equal and they'll have develop early pulmonary hypertension unlike an asd so if moderate they need to be closed early if they are restrictive they can be followed up all holes need not be closed so these vsds can close one by the tricuspid valve or by a prolapsing aortic valve So these are various types of VSDs. Again, depending on the septum position, perimembranous, inlet, muscular, we doubly committed, subpulmonic. So what will the surgeon do? He will take a Dacron patch, a polyester PTFE patch, and he will keep it. And so you cannot use pericardium because of the pressures; it will get bellowed onto each side. This is a more thicker, stiffer type of material that will be used to close the defect. So defect really can. rarely can be closed using a device so this is a device closure of the of the uh, uh, vsd which is rarely used because these children are very small we tend to do a surgical closure patent ductus arteriosus is a connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery 
Majority again can be closed in the cath lab. We use coils for smaller defects and we use a device for larger PDAs or if they are very big or the children are very small or uh, preterm babies, then surgically the surgeon will go in, locate this and clip it off. So when to close, if hemodynamic is significant, even in the neonatal period, it needs to be closed. Why? Again, the pulmonary artery is exposed to high pressure. They can develop early pulmonary hypertension. So this is a PDA angiogram done, and this is how we will close it using a coil in the cath lab. So this is showing that, and this is showing how the, the coil will be deployed and the PDA will be blocked. So relatively simple procedure. Patient again discharged the following day, 20, 30 minutes, the procedure is done and they can be discharged. These patients are not put on any prophylactic medication thereafter. So that's how the PDA will be closed. So this is for a larger PD, I told you, we will use a device and close. So the, the devices are costly, but they're all provided free of charge. So this is the device. It's like a small plug that we go and plug the PDA. So this is showing you how a PDA device is being deployed again. You, these PDA devices come in various shapes. So this is a different shape device that we are putting it across the PDA. It's a double disc device and we deploy it. So this is the iota pulmonary window, which is a large communication between the iota and the pulmonary artery. Again, you can see it here. Either you can put a plug in the cath lab and close it or do surgery and close it. Everything will depend on the size of the baby. AV canal defect, as I showed you earlier, they have a ASD, VSD and a single valve. Surgeon will patch the ASD, patch the VSD and make this single valve into two. So again, these palm, they develop pulmonary hypertension very early. So ideally, they should have their surgery done within the first six months of life. Obstructive lesions, pulmonary stenosis, iatric stenosis, coarctation, interruption. So this is pulmonary stenosis. Again, the first mode of treatment is balloon valvuloplasty, first line treatment. This is a balloon that we use. This is how we do it. We go put a wire across the pulmonary valve, going through the femoral vein, and we dilate it. Iatric stenosis, stenostiatic valve. Again, majority can be dealt, it, dealt with in the cath lab using the similar balloon. Balloons come in various sizes. So this shows how we go. We go through the femoral artery, cross the valve, and we dilate it. So this is balloon iatric valvuloplasty. Mitral valvuloplasty, similarly for mitral stenosis, usually done in older children, adolescents, following chronic rheumatic heart disease. Coarctation, you can see the narrowing here. Two options. One is surgical option where the surgeon can resect the steno segment and reanastomose the other ends and sew it. Or they can use a patch there or they can use the subclavian flap, sacrifice the subclavian artery and repair this coarctation. So other option is <clears throat> here you can see the echo shows the arch, blood flow comes and here it stops here because this is the point of coarctation. So this is the angiogram showing that. Then we can go with a balloon. Here again, it shows the narrowed segment. We can go with a balloon and dilate it. So this shows how you dilate it. So we use this quite a lot at uh, LRH to dilate even neonates. So older children or adults, dilatation alone won't help. You need to stent it. So like coronary stents, these are more firm, large stents that can be used and they can be post dilated later on as well. Interrupted dietic catch, for example, iota comes from here and it stops here. There is no communication down. It's the PDA that supplies down. So he needs surgery where you close this PDA and again reanastomose the descending iota to this, either using a patch. So those are all acyanotic heart lesions. So now to tell you something uh, in brief about cyanotic heart lesions, Tetralogia fellow, double outlet right ventricle with PS, we are both both the great vessels come off a single ventricle. It comes off the right ventricle. Can you see? The iota should come off here, but it's coming. So that's why we call it a double outer right ventricle. Tricuspid atresia. This tricuspid valve is atritic. No valve there. So there is no flow into the right ventricle. You can see the right ventricle is also hyperplastic. Single ventricle. Here again, you can see the ventricle is all getting all the saturated and desaturated blood there. Fellow. What are the indications for a BT shunt? You do a BT shunt only if the child has severe desaturation. Neonate coming, prostate and independent, or if the branch pulmonary arteries are small. If the branch pulmonary arteries are small, you need to grow them. Why are they small? 
because the pulmonary stenosis is severe, there is no blood or minimal blood going this way. So if you leave it like that, the branch pulmonitis won't grow. If it won't grow, you can't go and correct it. Correction means you close the VSD, you correct the stenosis. So those are two indications where will, you will do a BT shunt in a child with tetralogia fellow. Timing depends according to the center. People do it various ages, starting from three months to one year. We generally tend to do it around 10 to 12 months. But due to the enormous issues and waiting list, some children, do, we get to do it at 10 years. Double outlet right ventricle, again, as you can see here, both great arteries come here. So you can correct it, a biventricle repair where you root the LV into the iota and you put a conduit and direct the right ventricle blood into the pulmonary artery. So it's a biventricular type of repair. Transposition of great artery TGA, iota is coming off the right ventricle, pulmonary artery is coming off the left ventricle. So types of surgery, ideal surgery will be due is an arterial switch where you switch the two arteries. So you cut the iota and the pulmonary artery put the iota back here, put the pulmonary artery back here. So what happens? All the desaturated blood, pulmonary artery, saturated blood into the iota. So that's called the arterial switch. So these are the thing, you switch both arteries. That's called the arterial switch. But sometimes if the babies come late, then you cannot do arterial switch, late in the sense after a couple of months. So then the other less uh, ideal operation would be a atrial switch, where you switch the two atria where the SVC and the IVC blood are directed into the left ventricle. Left ventricle flows into the pulmonary artery. So you don't switch the arteries, you switch the atria. Then the left atrial blood, you divert them into the right ventricle. So all those saturated blood will go into the iota. So that's called the atrial switch. But ideally, arterial switch is the first line of management. Truncus arteriosus, where there is only one great vessel, iota, and from that you get the pulmonary artery. So you need to close the VSD and put a conduit and create continuity between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. So these all can undergo a biventricular type of repair. Then coming into total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, where all the pulmonary veins join into a common chamber. Can you see? Right-sided pulmonary veins, left-sided pulmonary veins join a common chamber. Ideally, all these should drain into the left atrium, but no, here it drains up into the SVC. So this is called supracardiac. This forms the figure of eight on the chest x-ray, or it can be cardiac type. They join here, drain via the coronary sinus into the right atrium. However, in this tap VDs, everything drains into the RA. Here it can be infracardiac, where the pulmonary vein joins to the common chamber, it drains down, goes through the liver, through the ductus venosus, gets into the IVC, and comes into the RA. So this is a, always obstructed. So this is a cardiac emergency where you need to do urgent surgery. Or it can be a mixed type. This channel can drain up, Plus, it can drain down. Tricuspid atresia, as I told you here, tricuspid valve is absent, right ventricle is hyperplastic. This is a child with a single ventricle. Then you come to the palliative procedures. Just to touch on a few palliative procedures, balloon atrial septostomy, we do it for TGAs who come very blue. Then we have the BT shunts. Then we have various other form of shunts. We have the PA bands. We have the Glenn shunts and the Fontan. Just to show some pictures on how it's like. So this is a septostomy done because if the child comes with a TGA and there is no mixing, then the saturated blood cannot go into the iota. These children will be blue. So as an emergency bailout procedure, we need to make this opening big. So we take them to into the cath lab, put a balloon, make the PFO big. So then what happens? Saturated blood will come, more saturated blood will come into this side, get mixed and pump into the iota. So the saturation will improve. So improve saturations if restricted pulmonary blood flow. So iota pulmonary shunt, these are your BT shunts. Initially, they did a classical BT shunt where they cut off the subclavian, turned it around and connected it to the pulmonary artery. So what happens? You have increased pulmonary blood flow and your saturation improves. But then they found that they, by doing this, they sacrificed the right upper limb circulation. Some children had ischemia, some had limb growth abnormalities. So they thought, no, let's not sacrifice the subclavian artery, let's do a modified BT shunt where they use a interposition prosthetic PTFE graft a tube. So it can be four millimeter, five millimeter, six millimeter, depending on the size of the child. And you connect the subclavian to either the right pulmonary artery or the left pulmonary artery. So this is another form of iota pulmonary shunts, again to improve or increase the pulmonary blood flow. Pulmonary artery banding, 
For example, if there is no pulmonary stenosis in a child with a single ventricle, they will develop severe pulmonary hypertension. The neonate will be breathless. So at four, six weeks, you tell the surgeon, go and put a band here and create a stenosis so that this child's pulmonary blood flow will be restricted. Also, the single ventricle pressure won't be transmitted into the pulmonary artery. So these are various indications. Or so example, if the child has multiple VSDs, two kilogram child, you cannot close the VSDs. But the child is symptomatic. Why? Huge flow across these multiple VSDs going into the pulmonary artery. He is breathless. He cannot manage. He's on huge dose of diuretic. So then you have to put a band. Then you restrict the pulmonary blood flow. Symptomatic improvement. Later on, you can go and close the VSDs and remove this band. Bidirectional gland shunt. What do you mean? You anastomose the cut the SVC, close it here and connect it to the right pulmonary artery. That's a gland shunt. Then the fontan completion, where you close the IVC, where it gets into the atrium, and you connect it with a tube again into the pulmonary artery. So what happens? All the desaturated blood won't get in here, will get into the pulmonary artery, get saturated, come into this ventricle, and go into the iota. So this is a single ventricle physiology, where you do a palliative surgeries. You haven't fixed the heart, but you have separated the circulations and given symptomatic improvement to this child. Ultimately, they end up with cardiac transplant. So what is the role of nutrition, hematinics, oral hygiene, venous section, and oxygen? So does nutrition matter? Yes. So this is a child with a VSD. You can see it's just skin and bone. No subcutaneous fat at all. Why? They have any increased energy loss. Their basal metabolic rate is high. They are tachypneic. They are tachycardic. They are breathing fast. So whatever they, little they take is wasted on all these things. They have decreased intake because they are breathless. They cannot be fed. They have recurrent respiratory tract infection, so they cannot be fed. They are frequently in hospital, so they didn't get the proper meals from home. Recurrent hospitalization, various medications, unpalatable medications, decreased absorption because they will have edema in the gut. So all these reasons end up with issues with their nutrition. So it's very important to pay attention, not say this child has a VSD, that he should fail to thrive. And no, because everything matters regarding nutrition for his surgery and mainly post-surgical recovery. Because he, if he doesn't have muscle mass after surgery, you are unable to extubate him because he hasn't the power to breathe. So nutrition is very important. You can do that using frequent small feeds, either gavage feeds or you can use drip feeds. If you cannot give large volumes, then you should pay attention to give high calorie feeds. You should avoid low calorie feeds. You should feed during illness. There's a myth that unatibbot especially in these children, you should not let that happen. Proper feeding techniques, top-up top feeds, either oral, NG, gavard, bottle feeds, something. You need optimization by adding calories. You can thicken the feeds, use more formula, uh, adding more, if you are using formula, thickening the formula, or you can add some oil to the formula. You can use, use margarine, butter, something to their feeds, increase the calorie content of that, so that with the, whatever small amount they take, you can give the maximum amount of calories. No point in prescribing a large volume, give them this much. They cannot take that. So minimal amount quantity with this calorie dense. Breast, always remember that breast milk is always the best. Drugs, make sure you always check if the prescribed dose can be given practically and insist on it. No point in us. We are very good at prescribing, but we should be practical. We need to advise on getting the appropriate strength of drugs, need drug sachets to be made, try to get the dose prepared rather than advising to crush the tablets or dissolve them, and use a syrup whenever possible. For example, we use small doses like 2 mg of frosamide, but we have a 20, 40 mg tablet. How do they do that? Spironectin, 25 mg. How do we do this? So we should be practical. For example, 300 mg, if you are asking them to give Aspirin 18.75, they have to break it into 116, which cannot be done, but we don't think about it. So if we thought and said that we can give a 75 milligram tablet, okay, they can break it into 14, that's possible, and give the same dose. So always check on your doses and give them in a practical dose. Oral hygiene is very important because we see children coming, even with normal heart, with endocarditis, a dreaded complication, sometimes ending up in needing mitral valve, aortic valve replacements, which is a tragedy. So 
so oral hygiene is very important venous section good or bad we were used to do regular venous sections we had formulas if pcv is more than 50, 65 we used to do that some say 70 so while in cyanotic heart lesions what is the reason for increased pcv they have a right to left shunt that leads in tissue hypoxia that stimulates the kidneys they produce erythropoietin bone marrow does more cell production so that's why your pcv or hematocrit is high so that's basically the body's compensatory mechanism which we shouldn't miss up why do they have a high pcv because they need to deliver more oxygen to the chronically high hypoxic tissue so that's why the hemoglobin is high that results in increased blood vis- viscosity so what happens again we have tissue hypoxia red cell production more more red cells produced you have depletion in iron stores and they develop iron deficiency anemia these iron deficiency cells are microcytic and they are they get more and more with your repeated venous section so you venous sec the body produces more and what do they produce iron deficiency cells so these iron deficient red cells are very 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 dangerous they cannot they are not less deformable so what happens they go in the mic cerebral circulation and they clog the circulation and they end up with infarctions and they come to you with a stroke so repeat venous sections are no longer recommended for that simple reason so you hydrate the child well accept higher pcvs know that it's due to the body's compensatory mechanism and try to sort it out either by doing a shunt or getting the surgery done as early as possible oxygen very often abused misused in the hospital and it's extremely dangerous especially in vsds you, why in a vsd they have a left to right shunt left to right shunt leads to increased pulmonary blood flow that's the reason why they are in failure they are tachypneic due to that so we think tachypnea we need oxygen we give oxygen we dilate the pulmonary arteries we increase the shunt and this tends to again change in uh, shift the child more and more into failure so oxygen when you are using it in shunt lesion be careful so the good physician treats the disease and the great physician treats the patient who has the disease so let's all try to look at the patient and not at the heart or the lesion or the vsd few case scenarios to sum up things a 2 year old boy with a large vsd admitted with a two day history of shortness of breath he is awaiting vsd closure there is no fever but the child is quite tachypneic he is tachycardic and he has a hepatomegaly of 3 cm room air saturation is 99% so what is the probable cause for this presentation and how would you like to manage him on admission so probable diagnosis he is having heart failure why increased pulmonary blood flow what is the management you need to reduce his preload by using some diuretics susamide ideally iv reduce the afterload like ac inhibitors if you reduce the afterload you will reduce the amount of blood going into the lungs oxygen causes pulmonary vasodilatation so it can worsen symptoms saturations are normal don't use it unless he comes with a respiratory tract infection low saturation then yes it may help so take home message avoid oxygen in shunt lesions unless there is an associated lung pathology causing the saturation next case a 3 year old child diagnosed as heterogeneous fellow awaiting total correction comes to your medical clinic she is cyanose saturation 72% plethoric with mild fatigability HCT or PCV 69 low MCV MCHC. What steps should you take? Yes. So we don't expect a venous section here. Low MCV, low MCHC. Iron supplementation is very important. Routine venous section no longer recommended. Iron supplements to prevent iron deficiency anemia because, as I told you, microcytic cells less deformable can block the cerebral microcirculation, leading to infarction. So they have found that hyper more viscosity is less causing. cerebral problems then this next case a newborn develops respiratory distress soon after delivery and on examination has to found to have dextrocardia saturation is 92% child was transferred for an echocardiogram at midnight would you have done something anything different if you were in the neonatal unit think for a minute yes so is dextrocardia low saturation so think dextrocardia what are the other causes so this is what the baby had he had a huge diaphragmatic hernia causing dextro position of the heart which he thought it was dextrocardia and this child so this child management would have been completely different so think simple think basics last cases during the postnatal rounds the mother says that she feels that the baby is getting a bit blue 
while she's sucking, you ascult it and say, don't worry, everything is fine. Wrap the baby up, baby is cold. Baby is admitted two weeks of age with lethargy and significant cyanosis. Anything different that you could have done? Yes. Taken a little bit more time, taken the mother's observations a bit more seriously. And if you had checked the saturation, you, should, you would have picked the cyanotic heart lesion rather than waiting for two weeks down the line. So, thank you very much.